Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, July 22nd, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I cannot give you individual investment advice. Please do your own due diligence and your own research. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, let's get into the slides for this week. So again, you know, the FRED website, we're big fans of it, ran by the St. Louis FRED. You can go to that website and track and look at all kinds of economic parameters or information or uh, that that's tracked. Um, one thing I want to say is I'm going to show some charts. I don't necessarily want to just say this is the end-all, be-all. But I think, you know, we're starting to see some patterns develop. And, you know, I don't want to, I want to be cognizant of not just cherry picking certain data points or, or um, economic parameters to bolster a bias I have that, you know, thinking that the economy is going to slow down. So we have to be cognizant of that. But these things kind of are what they are, and so I just wanted to point them out. So uh, this is a producer price index commodities, all commodities, and it's showing the percentage change from year ago. And so you see, obviously, after the pandemic, all of the fiscal and monetary stimulus, you had a significant year-over-year -year changes in commodity prices, right? Because if you create a bunch of money, uh, if you create more money than a sort of fixed amount of commodities, the price of the commodities will go up. Um, but what we've seen here recently is the fact that, you know, we've had a year of really tightening liquidity, higher rates at a very accelerated uh, pace, balance sheet being slowly but surely um shrunken and bank lending being constricted so we've seen the supply of money kind of tightening not only that we know that we're kind of in a manufacturing recession around the world we pointed that out that goes without saying if we just look at the ism um pmis but what we're seeing now is we're seeing kind of deflation in commodity prices right year over year change is now turning negative OK, so I wanted to point that out. So we definitely. I guess what I'm starting to suggest is the possibility that there could be a sediment change, a change in the way people look at things, perceptions away from inflation to maybe disinflation, OK, or deflation in certain areas. Now, it, I don't think it'll be across the board because I think everybody's kind of perplexed by this whole labor market situation, but uh, I just wanted to point this out. Okay, here's your PPI finished goods price index, uh, percent change year, year over year, same thing, right? Uh, obviously, if you have finished goods, commodities go in, raw materials go into goods being produced, that the price increase in the commodities or the inputs would logically, it would make sense that you would see the price go up for finished goods. Same thing though, we're now uh, in a kind of a disinflationary mode here. And I would also suggest that when we see these types of, again, the shaded areas are areas that uh, where recessions occurred. So you can see what I'm starting to kind of suggest, right? We Have we seen the recession yet? No, we haven't had the you know declared recession, but uh, at least in certain sectors of the economy are definitely in recession. But uh, I'm just pointing, I wanted to point this out. Uh, bank credit, like we just talked about, one of the main factors in liquidity creation. Uh, bankers have been cutting back loans. This is the percent change from a year ago. Bank credit, and you can see um, 
really, at least as far as this goes back to like the 19, 1970, maybe 50 years, um, we haven't really seen bank credit. Uh, I mean, it declines. The rate of change will fluctuate, but it would still be a positive increase in bank credit, except for the um, coming out of the great financial crisis. But you can see how precipitously this has dropped uh, over the last, you know, six months or year. And it's possibly going to go negative here. So this is not a positive. This is not inflationary. A lot of the money creation comes from uh, the creation of bank credit. And we're not. This is just another um, indication that liquidity is continuing to tighten, which will feed through into, you know, Eventually, my view is um, asset prices. As we're seeing, you know, rates are, you know, they're still talking about raising rates again, maybe one or two more times. Uh, the balance sheet continues to uh, run off at, what, $100 billion a, a month. So uh, this would all contribute, in my mind, to tighter liquidity, not looser. Uh, corporate profits again um they spiked obviously if prices go up i mean a lot of this stuff is nominal right change right percent change from year ago non-financial corporate business profits before tax now going negative you see what happened during prior recessions what happens and um as profits peak it appears that uh, when they finally do go negative, if they do, you're well into a recession by then. Uh, this is from the Paychex website. Paychex is another one of the uh, payroll processors. A lot of small businesses, smaller businesses don't want to have a huge back office for payroll. And so they, you know, contract this out ADP is another one well they track data so they they publish the data and so what we see here is it's small business employment is contracting right so you can go to the website and you can really parse down to the data by state by industry things like that but this is you know small business and we're seeing 12 months change in employment is is actually down one and a half percent you see the the big spike after the pandemic induced recession or lockdowns and how employment crashed at small businesses and then how it's come back. But now you see it's slowly melting away. And they also get into, I didn't put the chart up here, but they also talk about hourly and weekly wages. And you can see the wage gains at small businesses peaked uh, like six months ago. And so they're not crashing, but there's the same thing. The chart's slowly melting away as small businesses now begin to lay people off uh, and the tightness in labor, I guess what I'm suggesting is tightness in the labor market seems to be loosening up. Let's put it that way. Um, employment's coming down, it's contracting, uh, wages, weekly earnings, hours work, they're all are, are off, their, off their peaks. And so uh, I'm not hunting around, you know, continuing claims are still, you know, not in, in the hope framework are not indicating a, a big move higher in unemployment, either is initial claims, initial claims were down again last week, like to like 225,000, that's really super low. But around the edges, we're starting to see maybe some cracks, right? Um, this is one of them. So this is just another data point that I look at. Uh, to tell me kind of what's going on. Uh, the leading economic indicators now have been down for 15 months in a row. They were reported last week in the conference board. Um, again, we're now, we've been and are now still in areas that in previous, if you go back in time, would definitely be in a recession, right? Um, so this is from Charlie by Elio, the leading economic index declined in June for the 15th month in a row, the longest down streak since 2007, 2008. That was the great financial crisis, by the way. 
Conference Board is forecasting a recession from Q3 2023 to Q1 2024, driven by, quote, elevated prices, tighter monetary policy, harder to get credit, and reduced government spending. So we shall see, but, uh, you know, the, the LEIs, I believe, are 100% accurate in predicting recessions. So this is from GMO uh, Capital. They do asset management. They also write prolifically about Jeremy Grantham's uh, shop. And this is a chart that I like taking a look at that comes out every so often. And basically what it is, it's a seven-year asset class real return forecast. So I'm not going to get into the whole methodology. They've written about it. Um, but basically, they make forecasts based going forward over the next seven years what the average annual return uh, is they're projecting it to be based on, you know, the valuation metrics, a lot of return to the mean type calculations, things like that. And I find it interesting that with everybody being so bullish and talking about a new era, you know, we've talked about that before. I know I, I really did enjoy a lot of the debate that we had in the comments when we talk about this, because that's what makes a market, right? A lot of people are putting forth arguments as to why this is a new era, why the market's not overvalued, why AI is not, you know, a bubble. And I thought that uh, it was interesting even though we point out that it's never different, but evidently some folks put forth the argument that it is different. I put forth the fact that even if you have a transformational business, industry, company, theme, whatever, my view is that um, valuations do matter. And we saw that during the internet bubble and the great financial crisis. Things can get regardless of the prospects, like we use the example of the internet, are so transformational. But if a company, if all of that innovation, all that hope, all of that um, anticipated gain is already priced into a, a security, you can't just go up forever. And you have to look at the valuation. I mean, uh, but some people... Uh, I, I'm not sure everybody gets that. I didn't get that for a while. And I would start associating linear change as going on indefinitely, but it's mathematically becomes a problem at some point. I mean, you can't have, you know, if you have a $23 trillion economy, which is how big the U.S. is, when you have companies with trillion dollar valuations, I mean, they're worth, you know, 5%, 4, 35 4% of the total GDP of the United States for one company seems a little specious but anyway we had that discussion last week but what i want to point out here was if you look this is the anticipated real return forecast real return i suspect being after inflation and what you see is because of the gains that we've already had you know you're not going to just have 40 percent gains every six months or every year it's just like i said it's mathematically impossible and so a lot of the gains are baked in. So you need a return to the mean, return to the average, if you will. And what they're saying is that over the next seven years, you can anticipate uh, just in U.S. stocks a negative 2.5% annual return. Um, U.S. small cap, uh, a little bit better, around a 2%, a negative 2% return. What I found interesting was what were the areas that they said would do well and we've talked I talked about this about several months ago in a video and this is where I've been slowly but surely shifting monies uh, and I'll talk about that in an upcoming slide uh, emerging markets right emerging market value are forecasted to be at least equities the best performing um, sectors over the next seven years on an annualized basis real return and so uh, that makes sense, right? Because these countries, this, these, this area of the market, if you will, emerging market equities and emerging market value, they've severely underperformed for the last decade. And I've pointed this out. You can go look at, take a chart of the S and P, 
and po go to chart stock charts or any kind of charting software and take a long-term multi-decade chart of like the S&P and then look at a multi-decade um, chart of the emerging market index like the MSCI or world stock indexes. And you'll notice a this goes in cycles that are typically, it's not exact, but you can definitely see where when the U.S. is doing well, emerging markets are not in vice versa when when there's weakness in the u.s for a long period of time uh, bear markets you will see uh emerging markets or overseas markets doing doing better so i guess what i'll say is um you can go dig on the gmo website they have papers that they explain why this is and what their views are but i just thought this was interesting um they're a serious shop and uh I think it it's worth at least taking into consideration. Obviously, these projections are not guarantees. Nothing's guaranteed. They could be wrong, and U.S. stocks could outperform the world going forward as we're in a new era and we're dominating uh, technologically, and, and, and we should just stay the course. But uh, I would suggest that that's probably not going to be the case. So just to use an example, this is from Crestcat Capital, Tavi Costa. I think he is Brazilian, so he talks about this a lot. This is a long-term chart of the Brazilian stock market as represented by the Brazil ETF. Um, a lot of people like to bag on Brazil. Uh, I think it has potential. It's worth taking a look at. I opened some speculative positions there, and uh, it looks like, you know, if you just look here at the very far right, you see some action here. Now, I don't like to get into crayon marks on charts. This thing's this market's been in a downtrend for 15 years, you know, going on 20 years here. Um, and you can write, you can, you know, you can put, like I said, crayon marks on a chart and, and make arguments uh, any way you want. I would say that um, it worth, it's worth watching because if this, if this is able to break out, you could have a substantial run. Now, what could be the potential catalyst? Well, we already have a view that the next decade or so is going to be a resource uh, bull market, right? And Brazil uh, is fortunate is that it is endowed with many natural resources, oil, uh, you know, aluminum, gold, all kinds of stuff, farming uh, stuff, iron ore. It has multinational companies that are set up. I mean, you look at a company like Petrobras. I think that, you know, they are moving forward with a lot of um, increased exploration and exploitation of already identified resources. I think the stock is paying like a 20 something percent dividend. Do I have some shares? Yes. Is it in the portfolio? No. The portfolio is looking for more of capital gains uh, of, you know, 3x, 5x type capital gains over the next three years. So I don't necessarily see, you know, Petrobras as being that. But if you are, you know, a dividend investor, the dividend is, you know, they're paying, right? And uh, another company that's paying like that is Ecopetrol in Colombia. But that's a, these are different stories. Stay focused on Brazil. Um, so what's the catalyst? Okay, well, we think we're going to have a resource bear market. You know, this, or bull market, this bear market in Brazilian stocks, you know, has kind of coincided with the, you know, we had a long, long bear market in commodities, um, you know, a lot of people like to bag on Brazil and say, well, it's um, it's never meets its full potential, all these things, the politics there. Um, we, there's a socialist government now, so why would you do that? I mean, you just have to look at what's really happening, right? So um, that's why the price of Petrobras has not really moved too much because there's a lot of negative sentiment because of the government. Now, I, I, I make no predictions on what Lulu da Silva will do. I, I don't know. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, he's been the president before and, you know, the killing the golden goose is not the good thing to do. The other catalyst I think is worth watching is, is I was shocked by this. 
was pointed out on Twitter by on somebody I follow, so I went and looked at it. I didn't realize this, but Brazil has very high, the central bank has interest rates up very high. They're like 13.5%, right? They were very aggressive in raising rates to combat inflation. And I didn't realize this, but the inflation rate in Brazil is down like below 3%. It's like 3.2%. And so you have real rates there, you know, of 11%. That's very contractionary monetary policy. What if you're in a situation where you have the potential for a resource bull market in the next 10 years because of the underinvestment, because of the ESG mandates, all the things we've talked about. And now in the short term, you have another catalyst that could be that the central bank has the has a lot of room to cut rates. You know, if the inflation rate in Brazil is 3% and interest rates are th- over 13, what happens to an ec- this equity market if they um, cut rates, what they cut rates in half? What if they cut rates in, over the next year, 18 months, they're down at, you know, seven or 6%. What happens to equity prices? What happens to bond prices there? Now you'd have to say, well, what happens to currency prices also, or to the currency vis-a-vis the dollar and things like that? But this is your homework if you're interested, because I think there's a potential here for some uh, some action over the next couple few years. OK, uh, just simply on the fact that, you know, uh, monetary policy, you can go back in time, which I did. And uh, what happened last time when rates were the, were fairly high and then the central bank started cutting rates? What happened to the equity prices? What happened to financial companies? How did the banks perform? You can do this research. Um, there's like 35, I think, stocks that trade on the NYSE that are Brazilian-based companies. So uh, I'm not going to get too far into it, but I think this is an opportunity. Uh, I'll be writing about this more from the subscribers of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. But I think this is another area that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. Um, you can see it's just been in a long, drawn-out bull market. But what what I like is... It just didn't continue down, right? You had this big plunge after, during, you know, the pandemic. And look what's happened. It's kind of worked itself back. It's kind of, you know, bottomed. It hasn't, you know, really continued down further. Now, I'm not saying that it's not going to. It could very well be that, you know, we don't have a commodity bull market. Um, it could happen that, you know, the world stays in recession, that I'm wrong about you know, uh, Silva, and he's a socialist, and he starts doing, starts doing, you know, Maduro, Chavez type things there. I don't know, no one knows the future. But what I'm saying is, with the current hand that I've been dealt, and with the potential catalyst, where you have a 3% inflation rate, and central bank rates over 13%, there's a potential for um, the cutting of rates, and then, the, you know, what we typically see and what has happened in the past in Brazil. Like I said, take the time over the weekend to go back in time. You can, the data is out, the historical data for interest rates and what happened to equities in Brazil when they cut rates. So in the past, so, and then you, like I said, you throw on a longer term uh, catalyst or impetus being the uh, potential for a resource bull market. So I think there's some, I think there's a potential here and it's worth watching. You know, if the if the Brazil, if the ETF gets up, you know, close to 40, if it gets, I think it's trading around here, it's like 33, if it gets to 37 or 38, that would be a definite move higher, right? This is a monthly chart. So, um, you know, you're seeing some action here, but you could make the same argument at different other points on this also. So caveat emptor, this is not financial advice, but uh, uh, I'm, I think this is an opportunity. Uh, this was a tweet by Cuppy. Um, I thought it was humorous. I just wanted to show says he says here he was uh, reading many Q2 23 quarterly limited partner letters all afternoon. Let me summarize and save you a few hours of time. Dear clients, seven, seven stocks went up this year. We didn't own any of them. Whoops. See you next quarter. So, He's kind of alluding to what we've talked about in the past, that this rally's kind of been led by, you know, just a handful of stocks, uh, although it is starting to broaden out uh, recently. I, I will acknowledge that. 
but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we're in a new bull market. So I'm not going to go through that argument again. I just thought this was humorous. So I wanted to talk about this, right? Schlumberger, we all know, is the world's largest oil field services company. They provide just about any service you could want. <clears throat> Geotechnical, geoscience, you know, all kinds of well monitoring, you know, all kinds of uh, anything that you need, they can pretty much do. And so I wanted to point out, they had their conference call yesterday. I wanted to point out a couple comments that were made and then a comments from the Q&A. So it's a couple slides. These are the CEO comments before the Q&A uh, cherry picked. You can go read the transcript. But he said, uh, furthermore, we continue to witness a broad resurgence in offshore driven by energy security and regionalization. Operators all over the world are making large scale commitments to hasten discovery, accelerate development times and increase the productivity of their assets. We anticipate more than 500 billion in global FIDs, FIDs final investment decisions between 2022 and 2025 with more than 200 billion attributable to deep water. So he's just talking 500 billion offshore, 200 billion in deep water. This reflects an increase of nearly 90% when compared to 2016 to 2019. So the amount of spending is going to double from the previous few years, right? Five years or whatever. Okay, this is our whole thesis for offshore. The CEO of Schlumberger is acknowledging it because it's going to be material for his business. These... FID investments are global, taking place in more than 30 countries, and we are seeing the results with new projects and offshore basins across the world. So it's happening. We're in the we're middle of this thing. Um, again, do I think that there's still an opportunity in offshore? Yes, it's there's still an opportunity. Is it going to go 10 times from here? Likely not. This is another example of, you know, this thing is going mainstream now, this idea, this 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 thesis. Um, is going mainstream. It has already. And so a lot of the big move higher has already been made. This is why it's so important if you want to play in this sphere where where I where this is where I play, where I try to identify areas of the market or opportunities in the market before the mainstream does. And it's a very lonely place because we had to sit for a couple of years. You know, we I had and, you know, I think Trader Ferg was in the same boat. We talked about this several years ago. There was an original, there was a first move higher in offshore prior to the pandemic. It was slowly recovering and then it got short circuited by the pandemic. And a, company, a lot of companies, that was like the final straw. And a lot of companies ended up getting restructured. It was actually a blessing in disguise. But, you know, it didn't, it got, aborted shall we say that that first uh recovery then when we came out we just had exacerbated the underspending because nobody was doing anything the last couple of years and so then inevitably you know this up uh, the second iteration of the upswing began which was inevitable because spending had to increase and you know now that we also have shale now starting to people are starting to realize that shale's peaking now and so it's like, okay, well, we have to go offshore. The, you know, the thing about it is it's not just like wildcatting offshore. There's been a lot of work done already. A lot of the basins are identified. It's just a matter of doing the work. And as we've said before, now you have all of this, you know, they're talking about the CEO of Schlumberger saying it right here. You're seeing nearly doubling of spending uh, from prior time periods. But the problem is the equipment, the personnel, the assets have shrunk you know, I can't give you an exact figure. I haven't done that deep of research, but we know from all the bankruptcies, all the consolidations, that the industry is going to be not in a position um, to have enough equipment and resources to service everyone. And we're seeing that already. And consequently, what's happening? Rates are going through the roof. All, you know, prices, business prospects for offshore, people that work offshore, okay? That's the point. Now, it would have been better to buy the companies a year ago or two years ago. You know, when oil went negative, you should have known, well, you know, this is what I was buying a lot of this stuff. Um, but you have to sit there. It's a very lonely place. Who was talking about offshore? I was the only person 
parsing these, I wasn't the only one, but there wasn't that many people. Now everybody's onto it. That doesn't mean it won't continue higher, but you're not going to have the potential for a 5X or a 10X from these levels. Is it possible that some of these companies will double or triple? Yes. But the real life-changing wealth is by concentrating in big positions when things are really cheap and being able to just sit there and not do anything. So on the q and I'll read these comments. I thought these were interested. Some more comments that were made. A CEO was asked about offshore and he goes on, he says, I think obviously we did comment on the return of offshore where the first, we were the first to flag it and to call for the return of offshore, which is true. We've been, we've been talking about these, these conference calls over a year ago, uh, Schlumberger recognized the turn. And I think we have seen this international offshore resurgence materializing in the last 12 months and accelerating. And in the second half, actually, the offshore rig count will be higher than the land rig count increase. So this momentum is driven by the economics of offshore assets, where the final investment decision now, the vast measure of the FID, are below $50 a barrel, hence favorably positioned for final investment decision. We, all, we see also the emergence sort of the second leg of final investment decisions and future offshore expansion driven by exploration appraisal. Exploration appraisal is happening in many countries. There are many rounds of licensing rounds happening. A lot of exploration and appraisal is happening to find this next reserve and develop. Remember, this guy's from France, so the English is a little bit, the grammar is a little bit, you know, not perfect. So offshore is there to stay, and not only in 2024 or 2025, but beyond, as we can see, and with the second leg materializing. So we're in it to win it. We're in the middle of this recovery. Uh, we're going higher. We've talked about a lot. This is my this has been my highest conviction. I said this, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. I said it in the newsletter, too. My highest conviction uh, portion of my portfolio uh, is offshore services um and that's been for a while uranium has dropped to second and then below that is uh, some international stocks that take advantage of um what i consider emerging developing markets but regardless i mean here it is right so now what do you do well you just sit and let this thing develop okay um you let the cash flows pour in you hope that the companies pay down debt we want the Walter Schloss model applied here, right? If we're an equity holder, we want debt paid down. We want stock buybacks. We want dividends. What we don't want is rushing out and saying, okay, I got an extra billion dollars in my pocket. I want to build another, I want to build an eight. I want to be the first guy on my block to have an eighth generation drill ship. We don't need that. That will eventually happen as these prices stay high. You know, once, you know, will we see, like I've said before, will we see drill ship, Day rates at eight hundred thousand or a million dollars a day. I, I don't know. It's possible, I guess. Anything's possible in a tight market. You know, if oil goes to new all-time highs, do we have a frenzy blow-off, or you know, this industry would go nuts? You know, everybody would be it'd be like a gold rush, and then people would, I think, be looking to, well, guys, it's time. You know, they'll start seeing the management shift from you know what we want, which is return of capital to shareholders into a mindset of, well, the money's burning a hole in our pocket and I want to be, you know, the, the first kid on my block with a new toy. So we need to be cognizant of that, but I think that's still a long time down the road. And I just think this thing, you know, the only thing that derails this is if you had like a worldwide depression and oil prices went, you know, below 50 for a long period of time. A lot of these projects work at 30, 40, $50 a barrel. Um, and now with, onshore resources peaking and these shale basins, the growth is going to be offshore. So the longer, you know, I, I, I've forgotten to say this in the past, you know, a lot of the emphasis was put on shale just because it's so short cycle. You can get a drill rig out there, you can get a crew, you can get busy, you can have that well drilled in two or three, four weeks. Uh, you can do what you need to do and have it producing cash flow in a, you know, a, a, you know, a few weeks after that, you know, in the best case scenario. And offshore, you're making multi-year commitment here, right? You have to build, you have to get the rig, 
you have to get the equipment you have to get the sub c uh contractor involved he has to he has to manufacture that equipment you have to have all that stuff on station you have to set up a logistics base onshore in louisiana or guiana or wherever you're, you know wherever you're working offshore africa okay it requires a lot of people a lot of organization a big commitment of time and money and the payoff doesn't come for years and so as we, we weren't seeing that because it was so much easier just to shove capital into the Permian, Bakken, or Eagleford, but those opportunities don't exist. So now the emphasis has to move offshore. And so we're seeing it. You even hear the CEO here, EO of Schlumberger saying the same thing. Uh, you're seeing people now making these long-term commitments. So I think we're in the, uh, we're sitting in the uh, cuckoo bird seat here on this. And uh, like I said, just ride the, ride the wave. Um, Tommy Deepwater, follow this person on Twitter. A lot, if you're interested in offshore services, this person tweets a lot of good information. Here's the tweet. He lifts some of the uh, tickers. Rig rates seem to be increased by the week. Equity analysts are now asking EMPs if they have secured their offshore rigs from the Acker BP call. This is in Norway. This spells quote pricing power for offshore contract drillers. Here's the key statement they aren't building new ones and this just is a dialogue between an analyst and the chief executive officer of acker bp uh, the analyst says my second and final question is regarding rig capacity rig rates seem to be increasing by the week and rig availability is getting lower and we've seen rigs moving out of norway and now coming back to norway with additional costs pretty strange move by the way but i just wonder in light of this could you please update us on your secured rig capacity for the years to come? Yes. So as I'm sure you're aware, we have a drilling rig alliance with Noble and another company. I think it's a Norwegian company. We also secured a rig with Saipem, which is an Italian company. So as of right now, we have secured the capacity we need both for the exploration program and for the production drilling in the PDO program. So right now, there's no need for new rig capacity in the Acker BP work program. But I agree with your sentiment, yes. So it's musical chairs. People are scrambling. So what's going to happen to day rates? That's why day rates are going through the roof. And so this is just a you know another data point, anecdote, vignette, if you will, that uh, this is going in the right direction. Okay, some more uh, positive news. So there's a guy I follow on Twitter for my tanker information that's pretty plugged in he's he just wrote an article on substack the guy's name is ed finley richardson i don't know if that's his real name or his um pseudonym whatever uh but i would follow him on twitter all him or her whoever this person is on twitter uh i've had some communication with him pretty switched on on the tanker markets shipping and uh he just did an article on substack which i'll put a link in the show notes to uh, with regard to the um, uh, offshore service vessel market. And so what do we see here? So um, offshore ser service vessel order book is at its lowest on record. So again, people are not ordering new boats. This is good for us. As a matter of fact, the order book for... Um, service vessels has gone from 33% of the fleet in 2014 to 3% of the fleet cu currently. That's what we want to see. That's what we saw in tankers. We've done, we haven't done exceptional in tankers, but we've done good. And I still think there's more to come with tankers, but it's the same situation, it's supply and demand. And again, no one's talking about building new boats. As a matter of fact, the industry is slowly but surely consolidating. Um, so, again, read the article that I'm going to give a link to. And consequently, when you have a, not enough boats, nobody's making new ones, but the demand is going nuts, what happens? This is offshore vessel charter rates. Day rates are soaring. So this is the North Sea term, West Africa term. And you see the dates down here, right? I mean, if you've been paying attention, we were talking about this. And rates have basically in the last year just went nuts. They've doubled for all practical purposes. 
and no one's talking about it. This will start flowing through now into the reports that we see, the year-over-year -year, uh, reports for the offshore service vessel uh, operators that are publicly traded. This will make a lot of sense. Again, this was the time to buy back here uh, during the pandemic when the oil industry was going to go away, when you know oil was negative $47 a barrel. You see nobody was doing anything because there was an oversupply of boats because there was no activity. Okay, well, there was act, there's always activity, but there it wasn't the situation we have now. You had an, this is a commodity market again, you have to think of it like that. Uh, there's no proprietary knowledge on this. Uh, you know, you build a boat, you get a contract, you go out there and do your thing. So, I'm not making it, I don't want to sound glib. There's a certain amount of expertise involved, but it's not, there aren't huge barriers to entry, is what I'm saying. So, Although I think there might be now, because if you wanted to start one of these companies from scratch, I don't think you'd be able to get the loans. I don't think you'd have a hard time getting the boats built. So I, I kind of retract that. But again, um, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is is that you know you can see we knew this business wasn't going to go away. We investigated the business. You know, people a lot of pushback was, well, all of these boats are cold stacked. They're just going to bring these boats. But people didn't understand that this metal can't just sit out in a, uh, up on blocks in a field in Louisiana. It rusts away. It can't just sit next to the dock with nobody, you know, chipping and painting the corrosion mechanism setting on without going down and taking care of the engines and the generators. And all that stuff deteriorates very quickly if it's not maintained. And then the cost of once you started the, you know, activity started coming back in 21 and 22, you can't just go get these cold stacked vessels and bring them back. The cost to bring them back didn't warrant, you know, you have to take them for a special survey every couple of years, right? And as the older the, the vessel gets, the more intense the inspections become, right? The more cost is involved to bring it up to uh, meet the regs of the special survey so you can get your license to operate. It's not just a bunch of, you know, random people just doing whatever they want. There's, there's regulations. And I don't think a lot of people understood. They just looked at it and said, well, this operator, this operator, this operator has all these boats just sitting there. Uh, when activity does come back, all these boats are just going to come back into the market. That wasn't the case. That's why you have to do some homework. That's why you have to kind of deep dive this. That's why you can't just listen to somebody has an idea on the internet and run with it. You have to understand what's really going on. But again, we're again sitting in the cuckoo bird seat. These are, you know, multi-decade highs in, in rates. So we'll see how this continues. A little bit of nuclear positive news. You know, somebody, a wag in the comments was like, what's the big deal? Uh, all these things that you're highlighting are 10 years out, these builds. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you go look at the World Nuclear Association, they list all the reactors that are in construction that are being brought online each year. Okay. What I'm trying to tell you is it's not just like going to end in a couple of years. There's continually more and more announcements. Okay. That's why I think, you know, the, the undersupply situation in uranium is going to be with us for a long time, and it's not abating. We're in a growth industry when we talk about nuclear power. So France announces site for two more EPR2 reactors. Our old friend John Quakes, who we should follow on Twitter because this guy is like putting up all the news all day long, every day about any kind of, you know, news that is nuclear uranium related. France chooses third site for building a pair of new massive EPR2 reactors in a six reactor, 52 billion euro construction program. You got to remember, you know, it was like a year ago or two years ago, I don't remember the exact date that Macron was talking and the French government was talking about slowly but surely phasing out the nuclear program. <laughs> so uh, the sediment change has just been the zeitgeist, the change in, in, in views, you know, where even in like in Belgium and these other places we pointed out where reactors that were going to be shut down are now being brought back to life. And I did see an article in uh, the German media. Again, I'm, I'm not going to put a timeline on this, but I'm going to predict that eventually Germany is going to restart a bunch of its reactors. It was pointed out to me in one of the articles that one of the reactors that's been shut down for a while still has, it could be, it could be put into a restart, um, you know, 
they're, it's not been like totally shut down and dismantled. So it still has an operating like some kind of regulatory blooper that happened. And so again, unless they, uh, I think there's going to be changes. I'm going to get into the change in governments that's happening all over Europe. And I think uh, rationality is going to return uh, to Germany. And I think, I, I don't say when, but I, I think when a change in government inevitably happens there, that the reactors will uh, be turned back on or some portion of them that can be. That's just a long-term prediction. I'm going to go on record. So here's an, uh, this is a Twitter thread that I would suggest you read. I'll put a link to it by this Johan Christian Solid. Uh, abandoning offshore wind power. This is just the first tweet. There's like 12, 12 tweets. It's pretty good. Some of the news we've already talked about, like Siemens, uh, Gamesa having problems, losing a billion dollars. And, you know, I, I think some of these companies are going to go away. Um, the cost for these turbines has increased by 40% because why? Raw materials have went up. There was no technological advances. There's no technological logical advances in the wiring in the turbine or the gearbox <laughs> okay it's it is what it is and there's as the cost for the materials for that go into that go up the price of the turbine goes up that was as simple as that have they gotten bigger yes that requires more materials said wind turbine wind power companies abandoning abandoning offshore projects several wind power companies find themselves in a difficult situation as costs increase of up to 40% halts projects worldwide. I've gathered all the latest news about projects being abandoned or halted. So if you're interested in that, you know, I, I'm not, I don't do this to dance on the grave of wind power. I've built wind farms, okay? I, I'm agnostic towards this. I'm not a policymaker. What I'm trying to point out to you is, is that if you don't get the power from wind, well, you have to get it from somewhere. And I think that's why you're seeing rationality return and the shift back to nuclear because people still, like the Swedes, they had a change in government to a center right government and they said we're not we're going to we're not going to abandon the you know getting off of fossil fuels but we're going to abandon the effort renewables and focus on nuclear that is what i'm trying to point out so they're going to have an election in spain tomorrow and the polls look like you're going to see a shift in power or a new coalition government's going to come in with a center right and far right coalition. And uh, there was an article. Uh, obviously, this was focused more on, you know, the the climate change, the transition. How will that affect the energy transition? I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, we'll know tomorrow what happened there after the election. But anyway, it says a potential conservative government between right wing Partido Pop popular and far-right Vox would slow down the country's speedy green transition as the parties propose to water down targets and repeal key legislation. With snap elections scheduled for Sunday, polls suggest a possible change of government from the current left-wing coalition to a right-wing coalition. Quote, the elections will certainly impact the pace of green transition in Spain and Spain's projection at EU level. The transition is already underway and will carry on, albeit at a potentially lower pace. Well, we'll see what happens. I wanted to point this out because I have another slide here. I didn't realize that, you know, now a third of the governments in the EU are center right or right right wing parties. I, 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 I knew that was happening, but I didn't know it was that many. And this is a pretty good article. It show, has a pretty good graphic in the article that shows like all of the EU and all these, you know, by color, which, you know, country has shifted. Obviously, we know about Hungary and we know what happened recently in Sweden. Um, but in Italy, you know, with Georgia, Maloney. Uh, but, you know, this shift has happened over several election cycles. And a lot of it isn't just is about the immigration issue we have people it's the same view that i've said the same thing a lot of the people in the working classes are being feeling the feel full brunt of this and it's not like you have these fam mostly families coming in from war-torn countries you have military age men coming there with no families and causing a lot of issues let's put it that way drug dealing crime things like that 
And people say, well, you just like blame the immigrant. These people don't want this unregulated immigration, the people in these countries. And they're exercising their de democratic vote to elect parties that are going to restrict it and deal with it. That's the main impetus, okay? Not only that, the lethargic economic conditions in the EU, not only that, another issue is, you know, this is overbearing, centralized, communist, neo-Marxist, you know, technocratic government in Brussels. Unelected people like Ursula van der Leyen and her cronies that on the commission that, you know, don't, are, are making policy and, and, and people are becoming more nationalistic now and saying, we don't want to do that. I don't want to go with that. And, you know, you've seen, you know, countries like Hungary lead the way. You see the demonization of that the press has towards um, Viktor Orban. And you can agree or disagree, but, you know, uh, this is this is the democratic process. And it takes longer in Europe for things to shift because of the parliamentary systems and proportional governments and the need for coalitions. And so change happens small. You know, you have Finland, Sweden. Italy, you know, uh, Hungary, I, th I think some Eastern European countries like Slovakia, I can't remember, you have to look at the map. But anyways, you know, this article is pretty eye opening. I didn't realize that this many countries had shifted to the right. And I think it's going to continue. And I don't think it's a bad thing. It says across Europe, parties opposing net zero and mass immigration are gaining power as millions of citizens shift their allegiance towards poverty populist wing parties i don't like this whole right wing okay they they, they have a, a a view that's not you know ne socialist or neo-marxist and a back a backlash against open borders and net zero dictates the eu's traditional social democrats green ideologues and left-wingers are losing their appeal at the ballot box the rebellion why is it a rebellion the, you know if you know the technocratic class that includes the media and the universities, they don't like this because their power is going to go away, okay? And the things that they are pushing for, okay, are not going to get implemented. I think they'll eventually will because this this we'll have to wait and see if this is just, you know, a little bit of an uprising and it's two steps forward, one steps back. But, you know, this is the kind of language that's used, the rebellion. It's the will of the people. Do you believe in democracy or not? They don't actually believe in democracy unless the people they want to vote in get voted in then if, it, if 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 people have a different view if people you know want to have a referendum on changing the complexion of europe you know it doesn't help like these riots and stuff that you see in france people don't want that they don't like that okay and there was never a referendum in the u.s canada any of these countries that ask the people, do you want to change the composition of this country by bringing in millions and tens of millions of people from the developing world that don't necessarily have the same values that we have, that they don't necessarily, uh, you know, they come and then they don't, if you, you know, the, the problem, the mistake that is made is you don't bring the, you don't let people trickle in and assimilate. OK, you bring these huge waves of people, they congregate in their own sections of town and then you have, you know, they're isolated and it causes. Well, we've went through this before. And, and so it causes the everybody's frustrated. The, the immigrants are frustrated. The native population's frustrated. But this is, you know, the the technocrats is this is what they want. So anyways, it goes uh, our map below, which which I think is pretty cool if you look at it, I'll put a link to the article, shows that more than a third of the EU's 27 member nations are now run or highly influenced by populist style governments. That's what I prefer, populists, populism, or factions. All favor halting, all favor halting uncontrolled migration, tackling crime, promoting traditional families, and pausing hated EU laws aimed at forcing people to alter their lifestyles to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. <laughs> and this particular article characterizes that as a rebellion. Those are all things that I agree with. I don't think that those are abnormal views to have, but that's rebellious, evidently. <laughs> you know, of course you don't want uncontrolled migration. You don't want crime out of control. You want traditional families. That's the whole bastion of the nation is family. 
and pausing hated EU laws. So they don't, the, 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 the peons don't like the laws that are enriching. It's just a grift for the unelected class, the, the parasite class, the techno, tech, technocratic class. Yeah, that doesn't, those interests are not aligned with the people's interest. And so, yes, as long as they still have the ability to vote, they're going to, they seem to be voting it out. So anyways, uh, link to the article, you can check it out yourself. Some people, you know, they're not going to like this because, like I said, there's a good 30, 40 percent of the people that, you know, want Marxist, neo-Marxist socialism. They want to be told what to do. They want to, you know, they believe that CO2 is a pollutant. So, you know, what can you do? All right, guys, that's it for this week. I had to do a short one. I got things to do. Um appreciate the the subscriptions appreciate the support uh i hope these are useful to you again uh if you have any comments or suggestions uh or dialogue in the comment section uh definitely we'll check it out and interact as best i can we'll talk to you next week thank you